Windrow with a demonstration of painting from life and when you paint from life you are usually there but uh, because of the uh, wonder of television we can go out with a tape and tape a scene and then bring it back and work in the comfort of the studio which is available to everybody if they have a camcorder so uh, this is the um, scene that is to be found in the South Shore Nature Preserve down in uh, down off uh, the uh, Hexha State Parkway, I believe, and it's quite a wonderful spot because <clears throat> it's just overrun with wildlife, uh, <clears throat> everything from many, many, many deer to uh, wood ducks and uh, uh, creatures that uh, raccoons, of course, are obviously, and there are pheasants in the in the spring and in the summer. So overall, it's a very <clears throat> wonderful. Um, spot uh, that uh, where nothing is happening in other words if you say what do you do here the answer probably is nothing it simply is here and it's a preserve obviously you don't go hunting there and there isn't a great bunch of buildings with food and uh, seating arrangements available this is for uh, the wildlife and um, the kind of a place which Long Island is becoming more and more aware of that these are the things that have to be preserved with this particular composition, I'm going to play creator of scenery because there is, um, as you see on the monitor, when you were looking at the shot, there is a large, nicely uh, placed and comfortable bench upon which to sit. But it's a little bit stark, it's a little bit rectangular, it's a little bit looks like a box. And so I'm going to somewhat eliminate that and just concentrate on the scenery. Um, the, uh, the way I always begin is to find the horizon line. The horizon line is actually going to be a little bit above center and uh, as usual when I do this compositional demonstration I keep trying to uh, make sure that under people understand the composition is not that much of a of a terror uh, to have in mind. It is a plan. It's the way that you organize a particular place. This is obviously sky and this is the land. Somewhere in between we have, however, a nice arrangement of water and a preferred uh, diagonal, uh, somewhat, uh, somewhat uh, sh uh, gentle diagonal, but nevertheless a diagonal. And I'm going to um, eliminate the, uh, the large rectangle in the foreground just for composition and also to see whether or not that kind of thing, which is what I do when I'm out in the wild, uh, I eliminate things that I am not, that I don't think are going to add to the general uh, feeling of the place. Here are the uh, verticals, which is always needed in, uh, in any landscape composition. You have to find some kind of a vertical. Even though this is um, a, gonna be a long and thin picture, which is a, always a very intriguing shape. I mean, uh, long, thin pictures always have a certain appeal as opposed to the conventional 16 by 20 or 20 by 24 shapes. The, the, the skinny ones uh, are, are you know, nice to hang. There is a, there's also always um, a design uh, advantage to doing that, to having a long, thin one. Uh, you, you may have watched the program long enough to know that I do what I call parade pictures. So here we have the general plan, the compositional plan. The rest of it has to fall into place by, by giving a very arbitrary uh, line of what that background is. The background is the distance, way off there, and <clears throat> that is what is going to be interrupted by the growth of trees and the wonderful reflections in the water, and that is going to be built as you go along. But this is just the general layout and plan for such a picture. 
It certainly can't be called complicated. It is one, two, three lines with the two verticals, which you could probably count as five. So a five-line composition is certainly uh, easy to understand. I'm going to... Um, be working primarily with a brush. Uh, there's no point in, in, in the, 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 the area which is going to have to have a great deal of um, uh, uh, paint put on it is uh, scattered over the canvas in smaller areas. Therefore, I'm going to mix it right here on the canvas. I'm going to um, assume that the uh, monitor is true in color and that it is a, uh, in fact, a one of those um, pristine, clear, full uh, skies in which there is virtually uh, not a cloud and no atmospheric conditions whereby it fades down towards the horizon. This it w could be called a, uh, an absolutely flat backdrop. Put on with purposeful strokes uh, using a little bit of, um, of my medium here, my little liquid medium, to make it spread more easily and also to, facil to facilitate the drying of it. Uh, if you are working uh, out of doors and you have to do overlay painting, such as applying branches and trees and foliage and so on, <coughs> over and against a sky, uh, the, um, the need to have the paint dry rather rapidly is uh, evident because you're not going to start applying <coughs> uh, color over very, very wet paint. It picks it up and actually turns out to ma make a terrible mess. So, messes is what we try to avoid. And let's talk a little bit about the preserves in this, uh, on this uh, Long Island. I have been interested in it for a very long time. And uh, Steve Engelbright uh, was our, um, well, was our favorite champion of uh, pre preserving the uh, Long Island wildlife areas. He is now in Albany, but uh, the Nature Conservancy uh, does a tremendous job. And so do the Smithtown Nature Center in Smithtown, and obviously the Nature Center on the South Shore, of which this scene is a part. There are little pockets of nature preserves all over Long Island, and we attempt here with this local origination program, which now, of course, covers all of the island uh, uh, since uh, just a few months ago. That means that we can go and cover uh, these spots that are, uh, that are <coughs> needing to be preserved because <coughs> anybody who lives here may have noticed that the growth is really uh, quite staggering. <coughs> Um, I'm going to, I have put the <coughs> sky background in and find that now uh, the need to put the preparation of the uh, background in so that all of that wonderful, brilliant uh, foliage uh, can be placed as an overlay. I keep talking about overlay and we've got to, I've got to make it clear that this is my way of painting landscapes. And it may or may not um, appeal to everyone, but to me it is the most logical. I learned this a number of years ago with um, the Disney Studios when I was doing background work for, uh, for a number of, uh, of their projects. And uh, the, overlay, uh, the overlay technique is what is used there. I'm going to be using a very uh, nondescript color as the background for uh, the uh, four years that is along the edge of this pond. Doubtlessly a natural pond. Uh, it is rare that Long Island needs to uh, manufacture a pond. I'm not sure whether or not uh, Argyle Lake uh, is, uh, has been contained in Babylon from streams um, that feed into it. But uh, most of the time here on Long Island, the ponds are natural or they're seepages or they are uh, swamp areas in which springs are just below the surface. Um, this is uh, hopefully a, a, what, a, what I would call a non-color for uh, because it is so far away and uh, the uh, focus is not just in objects that become fuzzy in the distance but it's also color focus and anyone who uh, has ever been on a mountainside or at the beach on a particularly hot day in the summertime knows that atmosphere robs uh, the distance of colors and uh, so does uh, cold weather so does extremely hot weather and obviously so does fog and rain and so uh, with landscaping uh, painting, you, uh, I concentrate on trying to talk about the different focus of 
color as well as objects. And because we live in an area which is surrounded by water on both sides of us, I mean actually all the way around, there is a very intriguing um, uh, uh, color uh, focus that has to be maintained in order to be able to have it instantly recognizable that this is Long Island's atmosphere. And Long, I Long Island's atmosphere is uh, uh, probably unique unto itself. I have painted in many uh, corners of the world, everywhere from uh, Korea to uh, the southern part of France uh, to the middle of the Mediterranean, and I find that uh, Long Island, as I, uh, as I paint it, is unique in its atmospheric coloring, which may or may not be of, of, of great interest to anybody because they may not ever plan to be uh, painting abroad or in other places. But it's it's to be um, it's to be just to be thought of as um, well general conversation as I as I work through these things. The um, the lower part of any landmass casts shadows because of the intense uh, growth there, and so the lower part of this band of color, and this is after all nothing but a band, is somewhat darker, but it has to remain a little bit diffused and a little bit grayish because of the fact that it's in the distance. However, what it's doing is preparing the background for the details that, is going, that are going to go uh, in, into it as you come forward. As, as the painting begins to uh, find its way towards the foreground, uh, the, the, um, the, fo the details uh, are going to be against this darker uh, background. So, uh, speaking about uh, background, uh, I've been, been now living uh, in Virginia where the background is a very different design than it is here. Here it is pretty much flat with the exception of spots on the North Shore, uh, beginning somewhere around uh, Port Jefferson and he heading on east out to uh, Montauk, uh, Long Island's uh, horizons are flat, uh, whereas uh, down in Northern Virginia, the, the horizons are an entirely different pattern. They now wiggle. Uh, which is uh, one of the things that make it, makes it quite intriguing for me to be out there to have a whole new pattern of landscape painting. And um, that may, may or may not be one of the reasons that I, I'm working probably as hard as ever down there to capture all of this absolutely remarkable um, scenery. So uh, if anybody ever decides that they are going to go on a vacation to investigate these mountains, uh, I'm, I'm dipping here into the cadmium yellow, which the, uh, which the monitor is showing you, for um, use in the now preparation of putting uh, in these remarkably wonderful, brilliant colors in the distance here. These can be interpreted very loosely, very freely, and, and they need to be enhanced with, with a little bit of, of, of light, light color, uh, namely white and yellow, are going to be... Um, uh, just an interpretation of the uh, trees in the distance there because uh, a focus is um, is the thing if you'd made too much of a detail on those trees in the distance they would it would lose the depth that we're looking for i'm looking for always looking for depth that's the challenge pa painting anything that covers a certain span needs to rather than to be a wallpaper design it has to have some depth um, uh, I was I was in on uh, sort of on the verge of talking about uh, painting on the road. Uh, everybody now seems to travel very comfortably in automobiles. Uh, sometimes you fly somewhere, but if you are in an automobile, that's an opportunity to be able to put some uh, painting equipment together and to go down and set up. Uh, you should not have to spend more than. Well, two hours uh, doing a study, not, not a detailed study, but a reasonably interesting study of all of these places. And um, uh, if it were not for the fact that I've been concentrating on this for a very long time, I would not have paintings from all these places that I've been. Uh, I would have photographs. Photographs are okay, but um, paintings are, after all, what it is that you t interpret and what you see. So the, uh, the suggestion is, is uh, uh, is to go out and paint from life right out there um, and believe me it can relieve the boredom of a trip like nothing else can I can t testify to that that if the trip becomes slightly boring a couple of hours uh, with um, a box of paints and some brushes and some observation you will find that your 
whole attitude about that particular trip has changed. I'm going to take a short break for just a minute. I need to clear my throat and to clean my brush. So I'll be right back. back again in order to proceed with this part one of this wonderful thicket uh, with a pond. Uh, it's actually a genuine, really untended to uh, wild thicket back there and that can be rather complex. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how the how to handle uh, the, the painting of a thicket. I have done it a number of times. There's a painting right down here that I can show you a little bit later of a thicket that is um, that is in another one of the preserves. The nice part about preserves is that they've got these really very funky um, growths places where nobody has gone in with a lawnmower or a pair of clippers or anything and tended to it. It is all extremely uh, 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 loose and um, it is not easy to paint. It is quite difficult and therefore I'm thinking that maybe um, it is time for me to show you uh, that I too can struggle with this kind of a, of a problem of how to get the feeling uh, for this uh, sort of what you might call a disorganized growth. Uh, disorganized things are much more difficult to paint than a nicely organized one such as uh, you know nice clean mountain uh, lines in the distance or the ocean itself with a nice flat line of blue which tells you that it's the sea uh, to do the disorganized ones uh, presents something of a problem and so we're dealing that with that right now and what I'm doing is to not just prepare the uh, background for uh, for the thicket, but also the background for the reflections. Uh, there is a lot of darkness that has to be put in first in order to be able to get the light against it. So here we have, over here on the right side, and I, and I have pulled this painting out into a long, narrow, uh, horizontal picture uh, because when you're out there, when I'm out there in the wild, I find that I like to compose as I go along and to pick and choose the p places that, I, um, that interest me the most. Now here, uh, down, in the, down by the water line, there is a rather dark area. Obviously some great shadowy places is, is underneath there, but it's essential because it also separates the two, uh, the, 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 the land as well as the pond. Here is a very dark spot in here, which will of course disappear somewhat when the, um, when the details come over it. Uh, all along the edge of this particular pond, there is a dark line running uh, between the two, all to do with shadow and the play of light and the play of um, the play of things reflected uh, in the water from the darkness above. 
uh, yeah, I may be losing an awful lot of, um, of the sense that I try to make out of these pictures by explaining all of the uh, variables that take place in this kind of a composition, but it is the plan that I'm after. I'm, I'm, I'm interested in showing you how you separate the two, because if you ever do find yourself in this kind of a situation trying to interpret what you see out there, I think you'll find yourself a little bit confused about what to do first. And so I'm showing you what to do first, namely uh, what I always call preparing the background. Uh, it's very much like scenery painting, in case anybody has ever done scenery painting, that you have to know that the things that are going to go in front of it are going to affect the scenery that you have behind it. So uh, what you're doing is actually a, a small piece of show business. Here is the very dark, uh, the dark spot that is in the, in the, in the thicket distance, the thicket area back there and reflecting it almost immediately below it. Uh, now, the, um, the brilliant uh, blue of this um, a pond, which appears to be far more brilliant than the sky itself, I'm going to put in now. This is quick drying paint, as I uh, usually use, because it sets up nice and quickly. And I've got to prepare the water. And the water, of course, is quite brilliant, uh, much more brilliant, as I, as I said, than the sky. Uh, a phenomenon which you don't question if you're out there working. It is, uh, it is to be taken at face value. Exactly what you see is what you put down. At least that's what I do when I, when I am, call myself a realist painter. Um, I, I, I paint what I see with interpretation along the line. Uh, uh, maybe a contradiction in terms, but nevertheless it should be understood what I'm doing, especially as I demonstrate it. Talk about the realism that I'm after, but also how you uh, eliminate some of the um, realism and some of the detail for the overall effect. It's what sent the uh, wonderful movement of, of um, uh, the Impressionists, such as Manet and Monet, and uh, the, uh, the people who were uh, doing the atmosphere of a place as opposed to the actuality and recording it as if you were doing an illustration in a seed catalog. I'm not interested in that kind of an illustration, but I do want to make sure that the place that I'm painting is recognizable. And with that, uh, you, you retain some of the essential elements and you eliminate some of the others. Uh, with this small brush, uh, it is a demonstration also that you don't um, uh, use a four inch uh, house painting brush to do uh, fine art painting. Uh, you do it um, uh, with deliberate strokes, uh, rough as they may seem for this demonstration, but the, uh, the use of oversized brushes such as, I think I have one here, such as this. I don't use this. This I only use to maybe smooth out or to paint a, uh, the frame of a door. I don't use this on canvases. This is evident in other programs and it can cause a tremendous amount of frustration and also some pretty uh, dismal results. Uh, also, they all look alike. Uh, every one of the paintings that are done with that particular technique look as they, they no personality has of the painter himself or herself gone into it. They are all exactly the same formula and that uh, you can do that far more easily with less pain with a Kodak uh, or, a, or a Canon or any kind of a camera arrangement. So once again I have taken the opportunity to talk about the small deliberate strokes that comprise the business of putting paint on canvas in the form of a painting as opposed to a um, well, as opposed to a formula. So here we have the water arrangement. It's very rough. It gives you some idea from what you're seeing that there is in fact a mirror image happening. Now comes the very complex way of of interpreting a thicket. Uh, the darker color is gonna go on first because at this time of year, pale, um, uh, trunks of trees are the most evident thing uh, in the landscape. But uh, this wonderful brush that I have, I paid, let me see, oh I've eliminated, I eliminated the price already, but the cost of the brush, if it does the job, should be, uh, should be absorbed with the idea that he can't do it without it. And so the, uh, the taking care of this brush is the most important thing. Buying it uh, is one thing, using it is another, and the third phase, and equally as important as the other two, is taking care of it. These are, uh, these are uh, sable hairs, and there is just as much 
hair in the in the um, ferrule. This a uh, silver part here, this this metal thing that holds these. This is called the ferrule of the brush, uh, and uh, there is as much hair inside as there is where you where you see the pinch yeah, that's how long the hairs are in there they are uh fragile they're delicate they can take some use and some wear but they also react very badly to neglect and so if you can treat these uh, brushes like pets uh, almost uh, you take care of them and you make sure that they are in good shape whenever you put them down and are going to leave them for a while because paint has a way of of accumulating inside the hairs of this brush and uh, that is the uh, slow but inevitable death of, a, of the of the of the uh, brush so uh, I if I can possibly uh, uh, say it without being too boring and too uh, teacher like uh, take care of these brushes if they cost seven or eight dollars for a brush this size uh, I'm sure that uh, anybody will f will certainly uh, consider the um, the wonderful care and use of these things. Um, uh, with these, these close-ups and the ability to be able to see the brushwork close too, because if you were watching me out there in the wild, you would never get as close as the camera can to show you the technique which, you would, uh, which you is probably essential if you're going to get involved in doing uh, landscapes of this kind, particularly at this time of year, where there is no uh, ability to cover up the lack of, of this fine brushwork with leaves. It is all extremely visible. Those trees are bare. And that's one of the things about these uh, landscapes that to me are, um, well, uh, wonderfully challenging as well as mysterious and very appealing when you finally wind up with them. Um, you don't do this with any other way but a technique that you... Uh, well, you can, you, can, you can develop this. I am not a genius, uh, but I am certainly concerned with developing techniques that are going to enable me to do this. The brush is essential. Uh, it is a number five Windsor Newton series 859, in case anybody is really taking notes. And available, I bought this at uh, Pearl Paint in East Meadow just uh, yesterday, and uh, they are uh, they are seven or eight dollars a piece. But as you can see, nothing else is going to do the job uh, the, uh, the way these do. Um, the little uh, the reflections in the water below are going to be quite arbitrary, but they are nevertheless going to be there repeated, uh, repeated below. The time, of course, on this half hour is running out, and there is. Um, I haven't even begun to do half of this composition. So part two is going to probably take care of a great deal of the foreground. These two wonderful verticals here that are going to tell uh, a, a story about what kind they are. And when you're involved with this, uh, you can see what I'm going to tell you now is called unpainting. It's called scrumbling. And unpainting means that you're going to take a brush, is that I take a brush and I'm going to run it across the wet paint and show you how you get the difference between a genuine mirror image and an image of something that has a slight disturbance on the surface of the water. It is the same technique except that it's going to be it's going to do what the wind does. My brush is going to be doing what the wind does. It's going to cause a surface water disturbance which I think is a, is a nice a little um, a little analogy that uh, the uh, the painting is going to do what the wind does uh, it's going to um, it's going to give you the um, the arbitrary uh, disturbance on the surface of the water uh, many programs I have seen uh, don't deal with the business of the mirror image that is the same except that it is slightly altered because of the wind um, nature is a uh, remarkable uh, teacher it uh, if you're watching you can't miss the lessons. If you're not watching, it'll all pass by. Well, part one is done of this uh, nature uh, can preserve down on the south shore of the Long Island. And if you find part two, you may just be interested to see the final accumulation of paint. Bye-bye. Thanks for watching. Tune in again. This is it. <laughs>